Voices from the Past, Diary Excerpts from Pioneer Women Traveling Through the Bennington Area, a presentation of the Bennington Historical Society. Bennington is located on a historically important area of Western expansion. The Lewis and Clark Expedition of 1804 traveled up the Missouri River just 10 miles east of us. Another 10 miles to the south, the Union Pacific Railroad laid tracks westward, creating the Transcontinental Railroad. Much closer and even within sight of Bennington is the Mormon Trail, a trail used by an estimated 90,000 pioneers moving west. Those pioneers were an amazing group of people who gave up nearly everything, their homes, family members, in some cases, even their own lives in search of their dreams. They faced starvation, thirst, disease, hostile Indians, robbers, blizzards, sandstorms, rattlesnakes, and dangers that would be hard to imagine today. We'll listen to some of their hopes, dreams, and despairs as they traveled through this area. Kenneth Holmes compiled a group of diaries written by pioneer women. We would like to share some of those stories as they traveled through this area from the Missouri to the Elkhorn River. This material was taken from Mr. Holmes's book entitled Covered Wagon Women, Diaries and Letters from the Western Trails, 1853 to 1854, Volume 6. There are several historical sites mentioned in the following excerpts, which you should consider visiting if you haven't already. They include Canesville, which was located on the northern side of Council Bluffs, Iowa, and it's the site of a Mormon tabernacle. Winter's Quarters was a temporary settlement built by the Mormons in 1846 at the current site of Florence. The Mormon Trail Center is located at 32nd and State Street. It has a museum that has oral and video presentations that describes that community in the Mormon Trail. Not far from the Trail Center is the Mormon Cemetery, where nearly 300 pioneers who perished are laid to rest. One diary specifically mentions the Papio Creek, and it's undoubtedly mentioned as a small creek and several others. The Elkhorn River was the last deep river they faced going west. The area where pioneers crossed the river in 1847 is now a popular river access area called Elkhorn Crossing. The following diaries were written in 1853 and 1854. Iowa had been granted statehood in 1846 and the country west of the Missouri River was Indian Territory until 1854 when Congress passed the Kansas-Nebraska Act, creating the Nebraska Territory. By crossing the Missouri River, pioneers left civilization and entered the frontier wilderness in Indian Territory. So let's start listening to what these ladies had to say. My name is Amelia Knight. This is what I wrote on May 4th, 1853. Weather fair. Traveled four miles today. Passed through Canesville and camped in a lane not far from the Missouri River and waited our turn to cross. No feed for the stock. Have to buy flour at $3.50 per hundred to feed them. May 5th. We crossed the river this morning on a large steamboat called the Hindu, after a great deal of hurrying. Trouble to get the cattle all aboard. One ox jumped overboard and swam across the river and came out like a drowned rat. The river is even with its banks and the timber in it, which is mostly cottonwood, is quite green. It cost us $15 to cross. After bidding Iowa a kind of farewell, we traveled eight miles and camped about noon among the old ruins of the Mormon town. Here we join another company, which will make in all 24 men, 10 wagons, and a large drove of cattle. Have appointed a captain and are now prepared to guard the stock. 
Four men watch two hours, and then call up four more to take their places. So that by that means, no person can sleep about the camp. Such a wild, noisy sight was never heard. May 6th, Pleasant. We have just passed the Mormon graveyard. There is a great number of graves on it. The road is covered with wagons and cattle. Here we passed a train of wagons on their way back. The head man had been drowned a few days before in a river called Elkhorn while getting some cattle across. And his wife was lying in a wagon quite sick and children were mourning for a father gone and with sadness and pity. I passed those who perhaps a few days before had been well and happy as ourselves. Came across 20 miles today. May 7th, cold morning, thermometer down to 48 in the wagon. No wood, only enough to boil some coffee. Good grass for the stock. We have just crossed a small creek with a narrow Indian bridge across it. Paid the Indian 75 cents, too. My hands are numb with cold. May 8th, Sunday morning. Still in camp, waiting to cross. There are 300 or more wagons in sight, and as far as the eye can reach. The bottom is covered on each side of the river with cattle and horses. There is not a ferry here, and the men will have to make one out of the Talia's wagon bed. Every camp should have a waterproof wagon bed for this purpose. Everything must now be hauled out of the way, head over heels. And he that knows where to find anything will be a smart fellow. Then the wagons must be taken into pieces, and then by means of a strong rope, stretched across the river with a tight wagon bed attached to the middle of it. The rope must be long enough to pull from one side to the other, with men on each side of the river to pull it. And in this way, we have to cross everything, a little at a time. Women and children last, and then swim the cattle and horses. There were three horses and some cattle drowned at this place yesterday while crossing. It is quite lively and merry here this morning, and the weather is fine. We are camped on a large bottom, with a broad, deep river on one side of us, and a high bluff on the other. My name is Rachel Taylor, and my story begins at May 27, 1853. Went to the ferry on the Missouri River, but found such a crowd of wagons and cattle that we could not cross until afternoon. Went about two miles beyond the ferry and encamped. May 28. We were hindered by some of the company branding their cattle. Encamped near a small stream where we found a spring and wood sufficient for campfires. May 29th, Sunday. Had preaching in one of the tents. I think that I did not say that Father Royal and two of his sons were preachers. During the day, 27 teams came to the stream but could not cross on account of high water. May 30th. After traveling about eight miles over a smooth and pleasant road, we came to a log bridge, not the best kind, surely. A little further on, we came to Elkhorn River, where there was a ferry. This was crossed. Then came a long slough. After we reached the end of that, we encamped. My name is Elizabeth Myrick, and this portion of my diary starts at May 10th, 1854. Rose early this morning and washed some clothes in the afternoon. Went to Council Bluff City and bought a few articles. Saw an elk. May 11th, started on our journey. Got to Council Bluff. Stayed there half a day. Seen two beggar Indians. There was a good deal of money given them by the immigrants. Went from there to the Missouri River and camped for the night. May 12th, crossed the river in a steam ferry boat. Went a quarter of a mile and camped, owing to a hard storm of wind and rain. The same visited us today. There is a company of 48 persons from Savannah, Illinois, 
they have joined our company, making in all 64 persons. May 13th, raining this morning, a very cold and windy day, crossed two creeks. The men had to dig the banks to make it passable. May 14th, Sunday, started early. We are now on the banks of Elkhorn River, waiting to be ferried across. Have to pay $2 for each wagon across. The cattle swim across the river. Seen a grave where the Indians had buried their dead. They bury their dead on top of the mound, all in a heap thrown up into a mound. Met six Indians. The creation of the Nebraska Territory allowed people to set up businesses in a new territory to take advantage of all the pioneer traffic going west. Apparently the Indians found ways of profiting at times. They built a brush bridge across the Papio Creek and attempted to collect tolls. Some pioneers paid, some did not. Hi, I'm Mary Burrell. May 2nd, 1854. Cross the Missouri River on the ferry which cost $9.10. Goodbye to the States. Saw Old Sarpy and several Indians. About a mile from the ferry is the Bellevue Mission and Trading Post. Seven log houses, a beautiful situation and delightful scenery. Rolling prairie with scattering groves. Good roads, fine weather, and good spirits, if we are in Nebraska. Camped at noon near a little creek. Got dinner. Camped where there had been an Indian village. Hitched up and within a few miles before the Elkhorn, we crossed a creek called the Little Papio. The Indians tried to make us pay a toll at the little bridge, but we showed pistols and they let us pass. Mother gave the old squaw a silk tab off of a stock. She seemed very much pleased. May 3rd. Passed many teams. Fine farming country. As we neared the Elkhorn on a large plain and was a beautiful sight, could see the Platte River 12 miles distant. Seemingly on the top of a plain, is glistened and looked delightful to the beholder. Plenty of timber and side hills, ravines. Camp the east side of the Elkhorn, ready to cross in the morning. Fine stream and bordered with timber. May 4th. Crossed the ferry about noon, after Putnam had found the old cow about 12 miles back. Washed, baked ginger snaps, shook hands with several Pawnee Indians, and bid them goodbye. Very dusty and sandy. The Missouri River was the demarcation point where pioneers left civilization and entered the wilderness. They had to carry all their provisions. If it broke, they had to fix it. Nearly everyone suffered from malnutrition. There were virtually no doctors, and cholera and other contagious diseases were common. It is estimated roughly 10% of these pioneers died, along with thousands of head of cattle and horses along the trail. Graves and skeletons of dead animals were all too common. Dealing with sickness and death on a daily basis took its toll, especially on women. Lillian Slezel remarked about that in her work entitled Excerpts from Women's Diaries on the Western Frontier. She wrote, and I quote, The most singular pattern that emerges from the frontier diaries comes from the accounts kept by women of the journey's death toll. Records with a bookkeeper's care are the number of grave sites passed, the carcasses of dead animals, and the record of miles crossed. These particular records reoccur in the diaries of women who were unknown to each other on different adventures and with different destinations. They provide a startling access to the psychology of women and suggest how desperate 
were the emotional worlds of men and women on the westward migration, unquote. Just imagine months without adequate shelter, no place to get out of the dust, heat, and insects, no clean water or adequate food, no fresh vegetables or fruit, cooking over dried buffalo dung or chips, no hospitals, no doctors, no modern medicine. Most walked and some pulled a cart holding their belongings nearly 2,000 miles. There were outbreaks of contagious diseases. Some folks were abandoned for the safety of others. Your chances of dying on the trip was about 10%. Imagine losing a child and having to leave them in an unmarked grave in the middle of a vast prairie. The challenges they, these folks faced is amazing. And let's continue our story. My name is Mrs. Cecilia McMillan Adams, and this is a portion of what I wrote on my family's journey from Illinois to Oregon in 1852. July 1st, passed eight graves, made 21 miles. July 2nd, one of our company died. Passed eight graves, July 3rd, made 16 miles. July 4th, passed two graves, made 16 miles. July 5th, passed nine graves, made 18 miles. July 6th, passed six graves, made nine miles. July 11th, passed 15 graves, made 13 miles. July 12th, passed five graves, made 15 miles. July 18th, passed four graves, made 16 miles. July 19th, passed two graves, made 14 miles. July 23rd, passed seven graves, made 15 miles. July 25th, passed three graves, made 16 miles. July 27th, passed three graves, made 14 miles. July 29th, passed eight graves, made 16 miles. July 30th, I have kept an account of the dead cattle we passed, and the number today is 35. The tally of graves and miles traveled continued day after day after day of their entire trip. In some journals, the daily accounts of grave sites were transcribed as weekly aggregates, but they were never ignored. Not even births seemed to be recorded with such tenacious attention. My name is Ladissa Frizzell. We traveled west in 1852. Here is part of my diary. On the 30th day of the wagon train, we passed several graves. I do not think there would be as much sickness as there usually is, for we have passed less than 100 fresh graves. Hope the wolves will not disturb the graves. Saw one old cow, a paper pinned on her head. It stated that she had been left to die, but requested that no one abuse her as she had been one of the best cows. It called up so many associations to mind that it affected me to tears. Past where they were burying a man, scarce a day, but someone is left on these plains. On the 72nd day of the journey, I wrote, We are hardly halfway. The heart has a thousand misgivings, and the mind is tortured with anxiety. And often as I pass the fresh-made graves, I have glanced at the sideboards of the wagons, not knowing how soon 
it would serve as a coffin for some one of us. The families who traveled through this part of the country heading west did so at great peril in their search for a better life. Their journey was hard and dangerous. Many didn't make it. Many of the graves can be found along the wagon trails in the Platte River Corridor. Information of their passage can be found in local museums, on historical markers, in our libraries. Next time when you think you're having a hard day, consider what those pioneers went through. Based on their standards, we really have very little to complain about. We want to give credit and thanks to Kenneth Holmes and Lillian Slezel for their remarkable efforts in preserving this portion of our American history and encourage you to read their entire works. This presentation was created and narrated by Gordon Mueller. Amelia Knight was read by Ginger McGrook. Rachel Taylor was read by Linda Mueller. Mary Burrell was read by Lois Mussel. Elizabeth Myrick was read by Jan McKelvey. Cecilia McMillan Adams was read by Ruth Zeruba. And Lodisa Frizzell was read by Linda Clubundi. This is a presentation of the Bennington Historical Society. Thank you for watching.